Hello, welcome to this seminar uh, that I will present here online and to be shared with the general public of researchers, especially young researchers, whereby I present my experience on one of the most important disciplines and that is intelligence. As you can see that these days AI is a very hot uh, topic However, it's not new. I'll explain that in a second. My name is uh, Dr. Faisal Safi. I'm a, a visiting researcher at the Vision and Image Processing VIP Lab uh, of the Systems Design Engineering Department at the University of Waterloo. In this seminar, I will talk about two applications of biointelligence. One in engineering research, and that's basically the application of that intelligence in designing something, and that called the artificial intelligent imaging, or AI square. It's a power formula. We'll talk about that uh, next. And uh, we'll use the design case study of my research on CMOS image sensors, or particularly smart CMOS image sensors. This is the first part of the application of intelligence, and that is the engineering part. The other part that is no less important than this one is the education part. And in here, I'll talk about how to embed the intelligence on smart STEM education, okay? Using, of course, AI and blended learning. Here are my links to my LinkedIn, my emails, at school and uh, personal. In addition to that, you find here next, the seminars channel, which is basically my channel where I uh, upload my seminars on YouTube. Basically, this is a bit.ly link to make it easy. Seminars underscore channel underscore Faisals. And the seminars map, which is uh, seminars underscore map underscore Faisals, is basically an interactive map on Google, basically on Google Maps, whereby you can interactively watch the seminars I have presented around the world. Uh, last not least, uh, here is my course on microelectronics, whereby I applied this education technique uh, to my students in the, uh, since the fall of 2016. But you will find the same thing with the spring 2017. If you replace this link with microelectronics, fall or spring 2017, uh, underscore Faisal, you'll find my course presented at that time. Okay, let's get going. So uh, the outline of this uh, uh, seminar. Well, I'll talk briefly about myself and then I introduce the intelligence. What is really intelligence? And to compare intelligence to something else that is close to it is a system design. What is really system design? And really what I think that system design need to move, it's actually moving from systems design as per systems to intelligence design. And that's what I really am uh, promoting or basically I am uh, trying to, you know, uh, embed and uh, call for endorsement for future curriculum for engineering courses. Okay, intelligence design, which is a, a marriage or a blended discipline between the two. Then I go on my research, basically the first leg of the seminar of my research, uh, talking about how to uh, implement the AI square formula or artificial intelligent imaging on designing smart or high performance smart imaging systems. So uh, I will do that on uh, three levels, the system, the circuit, and the device levels. You will see how really important is that. Then, <clears throat> after this uh, first part of uh, embedding intelligence, I'll talk about the second em embedment of the intelligence, and that is uh, the embedment of the, uh, the embedding of the intelligence into STEM engineering education using multidisciplinary approach, or STEM, basically, I will explain uh, why it's a multi-sprinting thing and the multi-channel approach, which is the blended learning. Okay. And then we'll finish with the seminar. And of course, your questions are welcome but through those emails I've presented in the first slide. Okay. Good. So who am I? That's a very good question. Uh, my name is Gan Faisal Safi. I got my bachelor's degree a uh, while ago uh, from SETIF, University of SETIF. Uh, it used to be called uh, Farah Tabas. Uh, back in 1996 in solid state physics uh, with best honors. I uh, love physics, you will see why. And then the next one, I uh, my degree, which is uh, my master's, I obtained it from University of Malaya, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, back in 1998 on the digital implementation of neural networks. 
So we can see that AI is even earlier than this. Okay, so this is the first exposure of AI in my research, and that's where I really got fascinated by this area. Then I moved to Canada in 2005, obtained uh, my PhD on smart CMOS image sensors, okay, from University of Waterloo, uh, where I'm visiting a researcher right now. Okay, research area. Basically, my research is on intelligence design, and it's not intelligent, it's intelligence. Basically, I'm using the intelligence as a power huh, that I'd like to harness and to uh, design something at the devices, circuits, and systems. Uh, basically, that's what I'm doing. That's where my career is moving. That's my life, and that's my love. Now, the uh, career span, uh, both I have basically spanned uh, basically academic, industry, entrepreneurial uh, uh, realms, and uh, I have really uh, the taste for all three of them. And uh, for more details, you can uh, check my LinkedIn page. About the seminar. So let's talk why I'm suggesting this seminar. So basically, this seminar or this online seminar, if you want, is to inspire young generations of researchers. I want to direct them, give them some inspiration, uh, some taste of uh, what they uh, what they have to find or that, what they will find in research. Uh, what is really the career of my uh, seminar? Basically, I will use three languages, which are, are my, my languages I used uh, during my lifetime. Basically, English, which is the major language of, you know, of, uh, of this uh, seminar and I will uh, bring some Arabic and some French because uh, using multi-language help not only to expand uh, the boundaries of the uh, seminars but in addition to that learning multiple languages enhance the cognitive you know the cong cognitive uh, uh, capabilities of people so I'm here trying to promote learning languages to the young generations uh, and uh, the what exactly? So I'm going to speak about, uh, you know, specific topics uh, that is related to microelectronics as well as solid state physics and including education. Here, as you can see, I'm talking about multiple disciplinary here in one single shot because research cannot be single disciplinary. It's a multidisciplinary period. There's no uh, monodisciplinary research nowadays. And uh, as you can see from these two, uh, two items, the how and the what, we are using a blended seminar here. Okay, It's not specific for a specific topic. And you will see that doing so, we are bringing healthy food for the minds of young generations to nourish and to entertain and enjoy. Good. <clears throat> first things first, what is really intelligence? Okay. So intelligence definition has been, uh, you know, the topic of many scholars since the uh, start of the uh, civilization, okay, before and since the Greek civilization, because uh, current era is nothing but a continuum of that civilization, and even before then, they, it, it was really a topic of you know research. So we'll start with the first statement by Socrates, one of the uh, most famous scholars of that time. He said the following statement that will blow your mind for a while he said that i know that i'm intelligent why because i know that i know nothing it's a really interesting uh, statement and it reflects one of the first first and most important pillars which is a self-awareness this is the key for ai of the current time to take uh, to take up our civilization if you will if self-awareness is embedded in current ai that's it they are uh, the the power of uh, of the day the power of current times okay self awareness is basically to be aware about yourself okay and that's what socrates did by his, this statement okay well uh, he reflects that he knows nothing because he, that's the start of the civilization in in his own views of course and uh, by all means uh, the greek civilization has really uh, contributed like others big time, okay? And this is very important for learning. We'll talk about that next, okay? In Arabic now, Qa'al al-Khalil ibn Ahmed al-Farahili, this is a very, uh, a very important uh, scholar in Arabic, al-Alim Azim fi al arabiya Qa'al al-Nasu arba'a, people are four categories. Les êtres humains sont quatre 
sont quatre catégories. رجل يدري ويدري إنه يدري فذلك عالم. So man who knows and he knows that he knows. That's a scholar by all means. Okay. فخذوا عنه means learn from him. And a man who knows and here man doesn't mean man or woman. It's not not about here. It means actually both man and woman. Okay. ورجل يدري man knows يدري وهو لا يدري أنه يدري فذلك ناس فذكروا. And a man who knows, but he doesn't know that he knows. So is that guy is, uh, you know, somebody who is like a dormant. Okay, he he has forgotten his identity. Fadakiro means wake him up. Okay, these two categories are good. Now the third one, that's where really the coincidence between the definition of Socrates and uh, the definition of the scholar Al Khalil Ibn Ahmed. Meet, he said, and the third category, and a man who doesn't know, but he knows that he doesn't know. That is a student, that is a learner. Ah, teach him. Ah, that's exactly the statement of Socrates. Now, the fourth category, which is very discouraged, and that's a problem. We need to, you know, uh, solve it, but somebody needs to do about it. The fourth category is a man. رجل لا يدري ولا يدري أنه لا يدري فذلك أحمق فرفضوه. He said that's a man that he doesn't know and he doesn't know that he doesn't know. That's a fool. That's basically somebody who is like he lost his mind. فرفضوه means avoid him. This guy need to really have a lot of work to deal with him to wake him up and you know he has a corrupted system here. Okay, he needs to be treated. Okay, this is the first definition of intelligence. Second one, uh, which is uh, given by Albert Einstein, which is actually a con contradiction to Socrates, he said, uh, the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. Albert Einstein cherished imagination more than knowledge. And why? Because he thinks that intelligence is related to creativity. And that's basically related to making and designing. Okay. And, uh, of course, without having a good imagination, making and designing cannot happen. Okay? So, the second definition of intelligence, the, uh, as per Einstein, an iconic smart guy of uh, the last century, is related actually to imagination, not knowledge. As uh, Socrates mentioned, he related to knowledge, or in, indirectly to knowledge, but it's actually to self-awareness here. Okay. That's the second definition. Interesting. As you can see that we have a second definition, which is quite different from the other. Now, to make it even worse, we have these days different types and flavors of intelligence, namely analytics, linguistics, emotional, and etc. They are all related to psychology, as you can see, to the human fabrics. So uh, psychologists, however, and specifically neuroscientists, uh, they disagree of whether these intelligences are linked. They are not sure if they are linked. They are. They don't have any agreement about that, or even they exist independently from one another in the first place. So it shows the multi-dimensional, uh, you know, multi-dimensional aspect of intelligence. So the bottom line really is that there's no consensus on what is or what constitutes the intelligence. So it's a multifaceted uh, thing. Exactly similar to, or in a way, uh, similar to the wave particle duality of the light nature, for example, or the subatomic uh, particles. So basically, we don't have a single definition of an, an entity in the physical world, as you can see in quantum mechanics. So same thing for intelligence. It has different, multiple faceted, you know, uh, identities. So where do you go from here? We'll talk about that after we define what this uh, system design engineering. This is taken a quote taken from the website of system design department of the University of Waterloo. He said they, they wrote it very concisely and very precisely. He said, systems design engineering teaches the student how to acquire and integrate knowledge across multiple disciplines. Good. So it's an integration. It's a multidisciplinary thing. And it is the framework that is used to do system theory through which we view the world as comprising as comprising systems that interact and that's the thing there's no single uh, um, discipline that can explain everything or we can use it to make something really useful
So examples of these systems may consider include human psychology, for example, or psychological systems, or including also ecological systems, transportation systems, communications, energy, etc., etc., or mechatronic, okay? Which is in itself, it's a combination of mechanical and electronic systems. So it is through systems thinking, means the integration of all these systems, modeling, analysis, analyzing, and designing, that we learn to know the world and design something for the world, okay? which really I agree with that 100%. Now, what is really intelligence design then in this case? We said that intelligence has different definitions. So what do we do with those definitions? So what is intelligence thought to use it? So intelligence is a power. We need to harness it. And it's been harnessed over the time through these um, five ways of Harnessing. So the first one is the artificial neural network, which is the deep learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these interconnected of neuro, uh, nets of neurons is basically the intelligence that we have in our brains, which is nothing but uh, a faculty or malaka in Arabic or stendon in français, c'est un talent, it's a talent, etc. It's a capacity uh, of these neurons when they work together heuristically. As you can see here, I'd like to uh, to highlight that. Uh, uh, with a highlighter, uh, heuristically, okay, means we don't know how they process these neurons, how they process the information to uh, optimize it, okay? But what we know is that they do an excellent job in optimization, okay? So it's a non-algorithmic processing. This is happening these days, but nobody has 100% sure way about how to do, how these things they do optimize. However, physically, Physically, again, physics helps to uh, explain that. It's a relaxation of the energy uh, of these neurons to a local minima or global minima. Depends on where the dynamics takes it. Okay. Of course, the local minima is not really uh, a solution. The global minima is the one that has really so the, 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 the solution. Okay, good. So now, uh, the second harness of intelligence, functionality integration. And what we mean by uh, uh, harnessing integration, okay, let me use the uh, pen. The, uh, what we mean by that is basically related to how the brain works, okay? The brain is responsible of processing and or orchestrating many things. It's responsible of sensing, okay, we sense with our brains, seeing, hearing, etc. We control our muscles as well through the brain, muscles, eyes, etc. All the mechanical thing is by the brain. We do process also to make a sense of what we're learning using the brain, using signal processing. I mean, we do process these signals, okay, to, you know, actuate these, these, uh, these uh, mechanical devices, which are muscles, eyes, etc., etc., or muscles, basically. Okay. Uh, they do also, uh, pro we do also process like music, enjoy it, painting, etc. Et so these are very, very similar to many devices. The most famous one is the iPhone. I stands actually for intelligent phone, okay? Or all in one devices. And you can see these, uh, these things uh, uh, in the market. So by integrating functionalities, we are making intelligent devices. So thanks to this uh, uh, biomimicry of the brain, we are trying to make things quite interesting and intelligent by abstraction okay how we do that basically it's been done been done long ago uh, by the uh, emergence of math for example and physics is by looking to the physical world and try to abstract or you know extract uh, notions there to uh, to uh, to treat the problems and try to solve problems okay so abstraction was there since day one of our existence at, in this uh, in, on this earth now, the fourth one is the stratagem intelligence. This is a bit uh, related to system design engineering. It is basically how to, underst to understand how the universe systems work and interact to uh, together. Okay. So basically mimic how the universe is working in harmony, in uh, an intelligent way, and try to develop something similar. And that's basically my area. And you can see the other uh, uh, harnessing te techniques, they are using the same thing. They are mimicking. Okay what the biological or universal world is doing and try to, to do. And that's my area, basically. And we'll show you how. The final thing is basically to extract uh, uh, 
uh, I mean, intelligence has been used to extract meaningful information from physical observation. And that's basically related to security op applications like, uh, you know, intelligence. We say we gather intelligence. It's basically we extract information from the observed uh, world. Okay, good. All right, so uh, next. The starting point of this, on my journey in, in, in research is actually by uh, one of the statements by Aristotle, another Greek philosopher and the physicist, uh, okay, who said the very clear statement that nature does nothing uselessly. So it's up to us to understand how nature works and to do something really uh, similar, okay? Let me take that uh, pointer out. Uh, where is that pointer? I don't need this. Okay. Okay, good. Now, the second statement is by another uh, physicist and astronomer, uh, or astrologer as well, uh, Johannes Kepler. He said, the diversity of the phenomena of nature, so great, and the treasures hidden in the heavens, so rich, precisely in order that the human mind shall never be lacking in fresh nourishment. Okay. This is a quite blowing statement. It's uh, one of the best statements. That means there are tons of ideas and tons of you know, intelligence in the universe we are living in, all what we need to do, observe, watch, and learn. Okay, what's the motivation of my track? So basically, there is a need in all engineering disciplines, including mine, to face multifaceted challenges of uh, engineering design. Imaging, as an example, could that, it's actually everywhere in any engineering discipline. That's the, the need. We have the need to solve problems that are multifaceted. What we know is actually the biological systems ah, are proven over a long time, not for a short time, over a long time of learning and adapting from its environment to fit their multifaceted challenges. So the biological systems, they actually, they, are, they have uh, 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 solutions. They have been adapted to face multifaceted challenges like, you know, uh, food, security, you know, all the physical needs of these uh, biological systems. And as you can see, there's a shared word here or shared statement here, multifaceted challenges, see? So this actually links the two to make a solution of biomimicry of biological systems intelligence huh? and apply that intelligence into smart electronic system or, or else in my case is electronic system and application wise is on intelligence CMOS imaging. Okay, and that's what I called intelligence design, and that's what I really coined to, to be called artificial intelligent imaging or AI square. Similar formula to you know the power dissipated over uh, over resistance. If you replace A with R, that's the power dissipated over the resistance, and that makes sense. Okay, so here the power is by including the imaging and the intelligence in there, but and actually Minecrafting that. Good. Now let's start with biology, and that's basically the start of my journey into uh, imaging. So in uh, terms of biology, the the retina is basically composed, is actually the sensing device of our eyes. Uh, at the center of that retina, there's an area called the macula, in the center of that, there's a fovea. And uh, the fovea is located uh, basically by the center of this macula. It's just basically a pit, uh, as you can see, a small pit. Okay, uh, that contains the largest concentrations of cones, but there are other types of photocells. Uh, a scientist uh, by the name of Ramon Kajal, uh, in uh, between from basically the mid the 19th to the 20th century, he worked on the retina and he found that we have two types of of photocells. As you can see on the top here, we have the uh, cones uh, responsible of a color sensing okay and uh, they have uh, a one-to-one -one connection with neurons okay which are called ganglions these ganglions are actually part of the um, of the uh, of the retina uh, they are not in the brain so the first you know the first uh, emergence of the brain in the imaging is actually at the eye itself that's why the first part of the brain is actually at your eye okay so we we'll see with our brains physically and literally. And uh, back to the cones, they have a one-to-one -one connection with these neurons, which will receive 
the uh, the transduced electrical signal from the uh, reaction or ele electrochemical reaction at the uh, photopigments of the photocells they take that spa those spikes and they send it to the visual cortex of the human brain in the back of our uh, skull now the other type of the um, the photocells are called the rods they have a, a multiple to one interconnection with the uh, photos uh, with the ganglions or neurons okay and they do process that to the visual cortex in the back of our brain okay good so where they are they are exactly the cones these cones they're exactly highly concentrated here at the optical axis as you can see of the human eye okay and around that they're concentration actually diminish quite a bit quite a lot actually to the contrary to that the roads these roads they have actually higher concentration everywhere else except the optical axis and why is that well the cones they are responsible of the uh, high resolution okay because they have a one-to-one -one interconnection with neurons they are also responsible for colors that's why they are used for high priority imaging or high in, uh, region of interest or ROI okay of vision the rods however they are used for and basically the cons before we step to the rods uh, they are used in the day uh, vision the night vision basically it's mainly done through the rods because we need to integrate many lights of course we are compromising the resolution as you can see but it's night it's not day okay so this very interesting foveal distribution, because this happens really near the fovea, is of great interest, and I'll show you how. Now, back to the history now, it's actually the, the, the first man who coined the word camera is called Al-Hassan ibn al-Haytham. Uh, he is the father of the camera, or Abu al-Kamara, is the first one who named the camera. He is a guy who worked uh, of uh, al-Basra, uh, south of Iraq. Um, a while ago, long time ago, many centuries ago. So he's the one who developed the uh, La Chambre Noire, La Gorfa Sauda, the black uh, room, in which through the pinhole, as you can see here, he could see the picture actually of, of the surrounding inside. Okay, of course, this has been a long time ago and he coined it a camera. My, one of the theories which I, uh, I developed about this is that when you are in, in a dark room and you see just a pinhole, it looks like it's a, 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 a loon. So camera from Qamar, Qamar means a moon, okay? So if you are inside looking at the hole, it's like you are in the night and the hole is like a Qamar, a moon. So that's why he, came, he coined this al camera, And that's what I, I theorize about this, uh, nothing uh, concrete so far. The image sensors, however, they, they take care of this plane where the uh, image is reflected and basically transduce this image into electrical signal. Okay, good. Now, from history to modern times, we have two types of technologies. We have the CCD technology developed in the uh, early 70s uh, called the charge couplet devices. Okay. And we have the other the, the technology is called the CMOS image sensing, uh, developed at the JPL, uh, NASA's JPL lab. Okay, and the difference will be explained next. So if you imagine a, uh, the light is like a rain, uh, okay, uh, of a certain distribution. So basically the CCD is just basically uh, buckets, these buckets, they try to collect the rain and then uh, will collect them uh, vertically basically row by row and then serially or horizontally here uh, to basically evaluate how the distribution of the rain uh, in here or light in here basically okay so this is basically the simple explanation of CCDs uh, now at the device level basically CCDs they are nothing but this simple structure there are other uh, but they are not really major difference of this so basically we have substrate of silicon dot silicon okay and uh, we have a stop channel here to stop basically these charges or electrons to not go to the next rows uh, to stay only on one row and they are actually explained in here on the third image in here basically uh, through the clocking of these electrodes okay um, with these electrodes uh, that are made of uh, indian tin oxide or some other transparent electrodes they try or non-transparent they try to move the charge from using the fringing uh, electric field from one side to another and that's how basically it's read uh, 
The second technology, which is CMOS image sensing, is, uh, is quite different. So basically here, uh, the charge is converted right at the pixel, uh, which is the, the charge is basically here. We're using the capacitance of the photodiode, where basically it's uh, reverse biased at the beginning with a reset transistor. And then uh, the light will come and discharge this capacitance. And uh, after the reset is off, and that discharge is going to be buffered out using the voltage buffer, which is in this case the source follower, out through the, uh, the select transistor out to the column amplifiers and the ATU deconverters. Okay. So as you can see, the major difference between uh, CMOS image sensors, CIS, uh, compared to CCD is basically first and foremost, the conversion of the charge to the voltage is actually made in CMOS image sensors right at the pixel level. Okay. Where here. Okay. And uh, for the uh, CCDs, it's made at the very end. The charge is not converted to voltage until the very end. Um, of course, this has a quite great advantages, which makes the windowing easy for CMOS image sensor, almost impossible with CCDs. Um, uh, CMOS also is very nice in terms of power compared to CCD. CCD use high voltages, uh, at least five or actually above five volts, actually, to clock these electrodes to make the charge move. So where we go from here is the market. Well, that's what speaks loud. It's the money that speaks loud. And here you can see that CMOS has gained momentum over the years. Okay. And still now is going much, much better than CCDs. Why? Because of its lower, low power consumption. And that makes it really good for the camera phones. Okay. And not only that, but uh, other areas also are uh, showing interest on, CC, uh, on CMOS image sensors, especially the uh, PC and uh, computers, for example, and tablets. Uh, all the tablets now and the laptops, they have the cameras and stuff like that. Security is another area. Digital imaging or digital still cameras still have there, but uh, this is shrinking a bit because the mobile are taking over there. Medical science applications, automotive is actually increasing big, as you can see, forecasted uh, towards uh, 2020 in two years from now is estimated to gain uh, to uh, triple its uh, presence in the market. Automotive also is, uh, is expected to uh, to boost the consumption of these devices. So really, the uh, what we take from here is that CMOS image sensors they are taking uh, the industry by storm. The anatomy of a typical uh, CMOS image sensor is basically simple. Uh, we have basically an, uh, an array of CMOS active pixels, active because we have a voltage buffer inside every pixel, as you can see. And uh, around that matrix, we have a controlling circuitry that will control the timing and uh, the functionality, basically, of the, taking the image from uh, the array. So they control this array of pixels because we have reset, select, and windowing, etc., and some processing as well. In the bottom of it, we have basically a sample on hold, capacitances, uh, holding these charges or voltages, etc. The E2D also will come there and uh, as simple as that. Now, if we take a pixel, single pixel, this is the anatomy of a single pixel. We'll come back uh, later on as well. We have the, basically we have the three famous transistors, the reset transistor, we have uh, the amplifier transistor, which is the source follower, and we have the column bus transistor or the select transistors, okay? Oh, no, the select here. This is a, a different transistor, actually. Now, the photodiode is there where we have the uh, photoelectric effect taking, uh, taking place. And that's it. On top of that, we have the color filter. Uh, here it's red, could be blue or green, uh, using Bayer uh, pattern. And on top of that, we have the micro lenses uh, responsible of enhancing the collection uh, of the light, basically enhancing what we call the uh, enhancing the aspect ratio basically how much we can see per pixel okay anyways uh to my research now i'll show you my expertise in a nutshell i was not expecting people to understand everything here but i will go quickly about that and explain how i implemented the ai square the artificial intelligent imaging at the system circuit and device levels okay starting with what with the system level so basically at the system level uh, I'm trying, what I'm trying, I'm trying to uh, mimic some feature, or I'll explain you next, 
you will find it by the end. Some feature of the image visual uh, system of human eye, which are considered intelligent, by basically enhancing the dynamic range uh, or the optical dynamic range, which is the inher inherent capability of seeing uh, the bright and uh, dark spots of any uh, of any uh, uh, image, okay, uh, at the focal plane of the camera. And basically enhance that by using multi-exposure technique. And uh, the exposure, basically, what is the exposure? Exposure is nothing but the multiplication or the product of the incident light intensity by the integration time, okay? And uh, basically, by manipulating this, uh, this enhancement will arrive to a biomimicry of uh, a dynamic uh, range enhancement. Okay, how we do it at the system level? Basically, we keep the active pixel sensor APS uh, the same as the standard uh, three transistor APS, and we change the sampling and timing, and we uh, arrive to a chip that I called or coined pyramidal CMOS image sensor. So this is the matrix of pixels. Okay, as you can see in the uh, traditional way of reading an image sensor, basically it goes row by row. Okay, and uh, every row is read after that serially. So it's a one dimensional sampling. And uh, through the vertical buses, the uh, voltages are sampled down to the sample and hold down, down there. For the new architecture we are suggesting, the pyramidal image sensor, basically the, uh, the sampling is done ring by ring. Okay. So uh, the inner ring is red, and the next ring, and the next, and then the voltage of each ring is uh, dumped through the uh, buses, voltage buses in here, through the sample and hold bus, uh, bus uh, I mean, through the sample and hold banks of capacitors, which we have basically eight, one, two, three, four, and we have four down there, and that's eight. Okay, so they are read uh, red at the same time. So basically, one ring is red at one shot. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, it's a two-dimensional sampling technique, and the reading is through these diagonal buses instead of the vertical buses. This is basically the layout of a pixel, the inner pixels, if you will. This is a single pixel layout. As you can see, this photodiode, the uh, uh, reset, uh, uh, this is the reset transistor. Here we have the, uh, the amplifier transistor in here, okay? And uh, the select transistor is right there as well. They are, they are sharing here uh, the same uh, active area there. Of course, they are not the same. Of course, one goes to, uh, after another. And this is the layout. It's not very clear of the, uh, of the, of the uh, image sensor. This is the real pyramidal image sensor, the uh, micrographic image of that. Uh, and you can see the sample and hold are there. And here comes the reason why we called a pyramidal image sensor pyramidal because if you look at it is like you are looking at a pyramid from top and that's why we coined it or i coined it a pyramidal image sensor good now the second uh, articulation of this architecture is basically we change the raster scan from uh, not only from uh, uh, row by row to ring by ring but also we add to that the bouncing effect basically it it goes by uh, scanning ring by ring and as soon as the rings are finished it bounced back. If it was uh, a rolling or a raster scan, the scan should go back to the first and then continuously doing that. No, but in this change, we basically bounce off of that back to the first ring. So here, because we are bouncing, basically every ring will have a different integration time from uh, uh, for, for the inward scan, okay, going inward to the center. This is one one eighth of the image sensor. So the inner scan and also we'll have different integration time for the outer scan. Mathematically, this is, I'm not gonna waste your time in here. You can uh, reflect to the uh, return back to my thesis to see how uh, this was uh, found. But in a, in a more realistic way, this is what I'm talking about. So this imagery is basically 64 by 64 pixel, okay? And for every ring, we have first ring, second ring, et cetera, et cetera. We will have two integration times, the blue one and the red one. The blue is reflecting the outward scan, basically reading from the inner ring outwardsly towards the uh, outer ring. Huh? And the red one is basically the uh, inward scan from the outward to the inward. And as you can see, one, when, the, when one is very small, the other one is very big, and they do uh, interchange uh, uh, inversely 
the uh, their uh, you know values from high to low okay but if you take both of them and fuse them you get a uh, uh, monotonic integration time for all <clears throat> for all the rings and uh, therefore you find that the integration time the total integration time is independent of the order of the ring which is in this case r as you can see it here and then and as you can see when the integration time is small which is the case of for example here the, this one for example here so that means the uh, the inner rings they are they're going to be dark because they have the integration time quite small as you can see there okay and as you go towards the edges okay then it becomes brighter and brighter the opposite for the inward scan because the bouncing just happened at the boundary and then going inward it lighten up because why because the uh, the integration time increased okay so this is for the okay that's it for this and if you combine and calculate the dynamic range enhancement following this formula you can see that the dynamic range has increased over the inner rings until it flattened to zero in here at uh, this given border which mathematically can be calculated and then increases towards the outer rings now to make uh, to make the uh, fovea finally basically higher in the in the uh, center and uh, smaller to the periphery exactly at the periphery we need just to uh, uh, pl play with this parameter alpha which is the ratio between the sampling of the uh, of the pixel compared to uh, sampling of the row okay sampling of pixel compared to the sampling of the row you can make this uh, this basically this boundary here to the boundary of the image sensor and therefore the dynamic range will be what will be kind of foveated foveated in the sense of that the dynamic range is higher only at the center and lower at the periphery which is exactly or which is a biomimicry of the uh, of the foveated uh, of the foveated dynamic range or the cones distribution which have actually higher uh, dynamic range compared to the cones uh, i mean the cones compared to the roads okay and this takes us to another engineering aspect that is to implement or to digitize the uh, the image sensor the parameter image sensor you will need the number of bits to follow the dynamic range as well okay so the number of bits is higher basically the a2d would be higher in terms of number of bits up to 12 uh, for the center and decreases decreases when it goes to the boundary okay and that basically we are allocating more bits to digitize the image to towards the center that, because why the center is the most important one because we are looking at the region of interest always uh, right on the spot so the data volume that we are going to generate with this image sensor is actually foveated as you can see it's higher in terms of data volume here than in the periphery of the of the camera okay which is very similar to the human eye now some uh, proof of that basically if you take an inward scan an outward scan and fuse them basically uh, that's what makes the dynamic range enhancement which is uh, artificial in this case quite uh, quite visual here as you can see uh, we can see the this is uniform again but we can be we are able to see the bright spot here better well thanks to this because this is completely blown away for the inward scan because it's very white here and because of the dot that that, dark, that bright spot will over basically saturate this region and the only way is to get it from an out, uh, outward scan by combining them we can see it there okay all right so uh, having said that now uh, the rolling scan is basically will not be able to uh, to do a much better job as the fused image sensor okay good <clears throat> Now, another aspect of the human eye is basically related to the biological world. Uh, if you take or some a team, I think from a company, I forget which one, they took 500 natural scenes in here on the left side picture, and they took and they calculated the spatial powers, uh, the spatial powers spectrum, and they found it is actually higher bandwidth in the on the cardinals and the smaller in the oblique. Uh, 45 and 45 plus uh, 90 axis so this bandwidth in here and there it's very small and that's what they call the oblique effect okay the oblique effect as you can see in the picture on the right is basically show the sensitivity of the human eye 
to the contrast special as you can see sensitivity is higher on the cardinals 0 and 90 which is this axis 0 and 90 but is minimal uh, to in the oblique that shows that the human eye is actually adaptive like the biological systems as well to to the nature uh, distribution of uh, spectrum okay which is quite interesting now the pyramidal imager uh, in effect has its noise actually distributed this is the fixed pattern noise distribution of pyramidal image sensor and basically you can see that we have quite a bit of noise because why because the uh, the columns of the raster scan here in the classical camera is actually in our case they are obliquely distributed either 45 or uh, 45 plus 90 okay of course we have some uh, uh, some of these but uh, these are done basically because we have some mismatch in here in the cardinals and that's why you can find here so in another sense that the human eye will not be able to see these noises okay they are basically filtered out thanks to our adaption or adaptation to the distribution of the uh, special contrast okay so this noise that we produce with this camera with a pyramidal imager is actually less perceptible than the noise we see from the standard imager okay the second uh, approach for ai uh, implementation is actually related to the circuit level so from system we are going down to circuit and in here <clears throat> in a nutshell we keep the the uh, the uh, standard sampling architecture the row scanning and all these things but we change the architecture of the pixel okay and again the same philosophy is that we are only interested on region of interests the region of low interest we are trying to downsample or average in this case and basically uh, destroy its resolution for the benefit of the uh, the sampling we want only to give sampling high priority only for region of interest and for that we developed a multi-resolution CMS image sensor so this is the typical sketch out of this uh, chip okay so we are using multi-resolution decoders here to be able to see or to uh, to uh, to uh, average regions uh, here that you can see on the right side so that only regions that we select here for example they are not of interest we average them using row averaging and column averaging Column averaging means between columns and rows. That's row averaging. And then we need only one out of these brushed out region, which is the region of low interest. And why we want to do that? Because we want to read only one pixel of this region, not more. Okay. So this is done uh, thanks to the uh, th uh, th network of transistors in here. They do basically charge share uh, the charge that we just, you know, sampled through this uh, transistor from the photodiode on this capacitor okay so basically we take that charge and we do average with the next column or with the next row okay all right based on what based on our multi-resolution decoder okay and this is the layout of that pixel it's quite big it's actually uh it's not shown in here but this is a range of uh, i think about uh, 10 to 15 micron pitch basically this idea was uh, was actually presented in one of the SPIE conferences uh, a long time ago in Ottawa, and uh, that idea was actually inspired a team from Micron to patent their own idea on pixel binning, which is uh, nothing but basically pixel averaging, okay, uh, or chart sharing. Okay, you got to uh, protect your ideas if you don't want others to take it. Now, the application of that image is right clear in here. As you can see, these pictures, they are the same picture of Einstein. There are many uh, spatial resolutions in here. For example, his hair, his mustache, they have the highest spatial resolution. Uh, lower, we have uh, his uh, jacket, basically. It has quite a bit of number of contrast. Now, uh, we'll go one by one. On the leftmost side, this picture, basically, we use a vertical kernel. It means a vertical uh, rectangle, which we call it kernel of averaging. Okay, we average that. So see what happens when uh, we do the, uh, the uh, averaging uh, of the vertical averaging. What happened to the spatial resolution? Okay, see, as you can see, see the edge was not destroyed here see of his of uh, the yellowed uh, regions here 
was not destroyed. Why? Because these they are basically almost vertical. They are closer to being vertical than horizontal. However, if you look at his horizontal uh, edge here, it was completely destroyed there. Okay. Okay. So it's just to show the effect of the uh, shape of the averaging kernel on the image. Okay. The next picture, which is which shows the centric foveation here. As you can see, it uh, you can uh, basically, uh, as you can see, the when the foveation is applied, we're using this multi-resolution. Basically, we are using the fovea, the highest resolution here on the mustache of Einstein, but we destroy the other resolution there. So it gives us just a little bit of information surrounding, but on the region of interest, it keeps the information there. Okay. Now to compare now the third picture that I'm gonna show you here how it interacts. You can see now the edge that it was protected previously. Now it's gone. Why? Because the kernel we're using is horizontal. So the horizontal kernel will destroy any vertical thing. You know, it smear it basically. Okay. It's gone compared to the picture here of the very first one. So what we want to say is that it, in order to keep the information of the uh, picture, we're using multi-resolution, we have to be very careful. We have to detect the edge and see what's the best uh, fit uh, of, uh, of the kernel, meaning that the edge that is vertical should be averaged uh, with a vertical kernel, okay? And the edge that is horizontal, as you can see here, the edge, the horizontal edge was not as smeared as the one before here, okay? So the shape of the kernel averaging should match exactly or closely to the edge that we are trying to, you know, average. Okay. Uh, the last but not the least, we can have multiple fovias here, as you can see, the cravat of uh, Albert Einstein, the head of that cravat, and his mustache were taken with fovea. As you can see, are we keeping that information at the highest resolution? When we do that, basically, we are trying to basically uh, mimic the interconnection between the photocells and the ganglions. So region of low interest, we don't want to get that information, okay? Why we want to do that? We want to maximize basically the image information over the data volume of that uh, image. And that's basically the intelligence of the biological vision, okay? All right. Now, the uh, third part we are heading towards, but before we're going there, some introduction of what's going on with CMOS image, uh, or with CMOS technology is going actually, as you know, from 2D planner technology to 3D technology that we call now, we are using now most in our mobile or advanced mobile, the FinFET transistor, okay? Which is basically a three-dimensional, uh, basically a three-dimensional transistor. So the gate is not planner anymore, it's actually kind of, you know, has three-dimensional feature, okay? This uh, happens uh, since uh, uh, basically early 2010, okay? Okay, basically that's when uh, the nanotubes, nanowires starts, and now we are going uh, right to the 3D transistor and 3D stack as well. So if CMOS technology is, is going 3D, the imaging should go also 3D, and that's basically by introducing new technology in imaging. So the first technology that has been there for CMOS imaging was called the front side eliminate, uh, eliminated technology or FSI. Okay, so we have the photo diode basically at the bottom of the stack of the uh, you know wires and uh, uh, oxide here that uh, are multiple layers of that transistors on top. We have the uh, micro lens and the, the color filter. Okay, now with the backside eliminated technology or images, basically the diode is receiving the light from the back of the transistors. So now these are the uh, uh, the FOL. Okay, uh, part of the transistor. Now there's nothing that is basically blocking the light here to the diodes. Not only that, still it's 2D, but it's 3D in the sense of stacking two wafers now to bring one wafer of image sensor, which actually increase the cost. Okay, and now with the list, uh, the latest technology by Sony, this was actually pioneered by Sony, and now Sony is taking it to a whole new edge using 3D stacked BSI, basically including the processing memory and the sensing in one single wafer. So we have multiple of wafers increasing the cost, but as well increasing the performance of the image sensor. Okay. 
Now, the third implementation, which I promised you, was the device level. And basically, my idea is to find a cheap solution than BSI using the FSI. So again, this is the anatomy of the uh, active pixel sensor. OK, and as you can see that as we keep asking for higher count of pixels in a camera, OK, as we increase the resolution, we are basically decreasing the size pixel. And as we decrease uh, uh, the, the size pixel, so the increase in here cause the decrease of pixel size will the, the decrease of pixel size will also automatically increase the decrease of the image quality, meaning as we shrink the pixel, we will shrink automatically the photodiode. As we keep shrinking the photodiode, the signal that we keep collecting from this will shrink as well and will at some point will be below the noise. Okay, so what's the solution? Solution is to look somewhere else. Solution is to basically decouple the count resolution from the pixel size. And basically by making a pixel size, an imager or a, a pixel with the smallest possible uh, technology, uh, then we can basically keep that and just uh, put uh, as much as we need uh, to increase this, uh, the resolution. That's it. So the nature has done that by how by looking at the photocells themselves as you can see the rods and cones they are elongated photocells they are not planar they're not planar like we have in uh, the fsi technology or even bsi technology bsi is a little bit 3d but fsi was 2d because the depletion region was absolutely 2d very thin a sub micron actually a layer of uh, you know depletion region from which we uh, basically uh, separate the electron hole pairs to get some meaningful uh, signal so as you can see the rods and cones they are actually uh, elongated structures 3d structures they are not planar so from that i got inspired why not making the photodiode itself a pillar or a 3d that's where we got the uh, the, the idea of building uh, an image sensor with a 3D uh, photo, photo rod that I called it initially. So uh, uh, basically the fabrication of this photo, photo rod is very simple, very easy using basically uh, the lift off, uh, lift off uh, technique, okay? To deposit a mask of uh, a certain metal, okay? And then etch away the silicon and then remove the chrome and then uh, and then basically do, uh, do the doping of these things. Now, integrating these into CMOS process, that's a different story. This is what I'm trying to do right now. And basically getting these uh, as thin as we want uh, these uh, photo rods is uh, uh, it's an ongoing research I've, uh, uh, um, I've done at uh, the Quantum Nano Center at the University of Waterloo as well as University of Alberta, thanks to the collaborator, uh, basically Dr. Bokwi and uh, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Boy from University of Alberta and Bokwi from the Quantum Nano Center. So basically we come up with these uh, pillars and of course the uh, smoothness is something that we need to uh, work on is in the uh, nanometer range, but still there's a lot of room to improve. And uh, the question is to how to integrate to, to CMOS, which is uh, another question by itself. Now, uh, using some uh, empirical uh, equations I have uh, taken from the literature, basically I proven in a paper uh, presented in uh, ISCAS conference uh, back in 2010 uh, or 11, I think 10, yeah, in Rio de Janeiro, I proven that the sensitivity of these kind of photodiodes is actually proportional to the height. Okay, and this is very very interesting. Why? Because the biology does it as well in a, a type of frogs called bullfrogs and type of fish I found after the derivation that indeed they do control their vision sensitivity by contracting their photocells when there is too much of light and elongating their photocells when there is little of light. That means the biological visual systems devices, they're actually adaptive to do the height. That means there is a strong relationship between the height and the sensitivity of these photocells. We're basically here, silicon meeting the wet uh, devices here, the photocells of the biological uh, visions. 
it's quite interesting that both of them they they follow the same profile not exactly the same you know uh, uh but the same profile being meaning that the sensitivity here is proportional to the height okay so this is uh, quite interesting it shows the fractal nature of our universe so like the fractal image of the solar system that we find it now in atoms thanks to Niels Bohr you know model of the atom okay now the application of the photo rods they're quite uh, wide open one of them I coined some servasting me basically by combining the sensing and energy harvesting of these photodiodes we can make a, a camera is something that is planned in the future camera that we have basically the photo rods on top of the camera basically collecting the energy and feeding that down to the ROIC uh, the readout uh, integrated circuit of the image sensor and basically uh, feeding that power for another photo rods again to basically to get the image uh, sensed there okay so this is basically for batteryless camera uh, this also this technology that was patented uh, back in 2010 it's uh, quite interesting for another application the wireless endoscopic uh, camera basically that uh, people they swallow and it takes the image of their uh, gi uh, track okay uh, video phones of course consumers are looking for better images higher resolutions and etc etc uh, automotive imaging as well this technology is quite interesting very very promising for that as well okay uh so uh the device level implementation basically uh it's the name of the game is that simos imaging need to go 3d and is going there shyly with bsi technology but with this technology we can basically get the benefit of low cost of the fsi with the quality of the bsi and that's that's quite a, a promising and it will make the image quality much much better at cheaper cost okay for references i uh, i uh, advise you to check my cv for references of the publications i made at cv underscore files and bitly okay website okay i have a book and the patent as well talking about these things uh now the uh second part of my uh seminar and that basically how to use intelligence in education and basically i have these four questions i i want that uh, that motivate my interest is the engagement of students first and foremost we need to engage students to learn otherwise there's no meaning for education okay and to take their learning process and experience whole in new new in new level how to do that second question is we need to really to define again to the kids what's the uh, uh, purpose or objective of, of education uh, and teaching is it to get a better job or for something else that's another thing i uh, reflect upon and the uh, third point is uh, are the grades really what matters the most or do they really reflect the memory recall or skills i just had a meeting with the principal of uh, my son's uh, high school and uh, really it's a debate that uh, really need to be uh, taken uh, seriously the grades are not in my point of view what reflects the, uh, the, uh, the 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 knowledge and skills they they reflect the memory recall that's it we need to come up with a different system of uh, evaluation and filtering now does the teaching need also to be changed is it uh, it should be kept master slave way or interactive uh, self-driven approach i'll talk about that in a second now engaging students i talked about that uh, about this in a panel discussion i have it uh, a while ago okay at uh, uae university with two other uh, instructors or professors uh, dr qasim and uh, dr zelfa uh, whereby i i i thought that uh, educational teaching basically uh, the psychology is the key to motivate to motivate students uh, along with the blended teaching uh, that's that's i think these two they will improve the student engagement because we are dealing with humans not with machines okay and uh, that's my teaching mission and statement okay which uh, you can find it next in in my in my uh, video in, in youtube for the to view the discussion the uh, panel discussion you can you are advised to uh, to go to this uh, bitly uh, 
pink okay and uh, for some reason this did not uh, work okay that's fine I think something is being done in the background okay let's go next so my teaching statement it can be viewed here in this uh, in this video I will try to uh, Okay, unfortunately it didn't work this time. But... Anyways, you are advised to go there. Basically what I, w what I wanted to say is basically we need to understand our students so that we can basically teach them. Uh, thank God that this is working. So let me uh, get you to there. So without uh, further ado. Let me introduce myself first of all. I uh, my my business, if you want, uh, my work is actually on implementation of intelligence in uh, electrical circuits or in electronic devices, if you want. Um, I don't want to talk about my CV. It's not the, the right uh, the right point. But what I'd like to say that intelligence is an important factor that need to be revived in our students. And why we are doing that? Because at the end of the day, why we are teaching. Seriously, why we are teaching? Are we teaching to uh, to store information and then recall it in the exams? Uh, is that is that the point? If it is the point, then we are wasting our time because I can uh, put that information in a memory stick and get it back later on. And in fact, that's a that's an issue I'm suffering in my courses. I'm telling, I, I told uh, my students, and also it's in uh, my YouTube channel. I mentioned to my students, listen, I I'm not, I don't want you to work as memory sticks. Or memory devices. I can get the whole textbook in, you know, thumbnail device, and boom, that's it. I don't need that. That's not the point. But the point is to make them intelligent and make them self-aware. And that's the point I'd like to start. I actually back to uh, you know Greek, uh, you know uh, heritage. I love that. It's uh, it's amazing. And uh, I quote uh, Aristotle, uh, a Greek philosopher. He said something about intelligence. He said, "Listen, guys." I know I'm intelligent because I know I know nothing. It's a, it's a well-known quotation, you know? Yeah. He said, I repeat, he said, I know I'm intelligent because I know I know nothing. And it's a very blowing uh, statement if you think about it. And actually it, uh, it dictates one of the corner definitions of intelligence. And later on other, you know, civilizations and other people, even Einstein and others, I reported that in my talks as well in my YouTube channel. Many definitions of intelligence, but this is the one I found it really fundamental for teaching. Okay, because teaching is to make the individuals, in our case, the students, self-aware, and self-awareness is one of the biggest intelligent cornerstones. Okay, and that's why nowadays AI, artificial intelligence, is booming. Google, you name Google, you name uh, Apple and the big boys in industry. So what do you mean by self-aware? That's good. I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. They are working on this, uh, on AI, and they are really advancing. And the link that will make AI really scary, especially uh, to uh, Steve, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, uh, no, Steve, and, uh, Steve Hawking and Bill Gates and others who are against AI, artificial intelligence, is to make AI self-aware. If you make an AI, an artificial, uh, an artificial intelligence system, electronic or software, whatever you call it, if you make it self-aware, boom, it's gone. That's it. They will take over the whole business of creativity, of control, of uh, buy, buy. That's it. The human will jump from an era to another era. Okay, good. Now back to self-awareness. If you look at Aristotle's statement, he said, again, I'm repeating, he said that in, I'm intelligent because I know that I know nothing. So this feedback on his own intelligence or in his own uh, uh, knowledge, if you want. This feedback, that's what self is like a mirror of his own mind. He knows that he knows nothing. Of course he knows nothing. It's the start of the knowledge era, you know, uh, the Greek civilization by all means, you know. So this to be, to know about your own status, huh? this is a big thing in, in, in intelligence. It's actually the, 
the pillar number one in intelligence, okay? So this self-awareness encompasses big things, and that's why I saw that the intelligence can help actually teaching. Teaching, we need to make the students, and that's my philosophy, we need to make the students self-aware about what they are studying. Like uh, Dr. Zerfan there, uh, coming to, uh, to that uh, note, to make self, to experiment, experiential, uh, you know, teaching, okay? Or what you call it, I was writing on the cup, so I have to read from there. No, no, no. So sorry about that. So you have to make it doing self-awareness, meaning they have to reflect on themselves, what did they learn? And how they were learning it. Is it good or not? This will come to self-assessment, okay? Are they really, they did their good job? So this self-awareness is a big issue or is a big uh, cornerstone in the teaching. Huh? This is what we need really to implement. Now, what they did, right? Okay, all right. And why we want this self-awareness? It's not because intelligence is sweet and we like it. All of us, we like it. It's what differentiates us from the rest of the biological world because we are intelligent. But not only that, self-awareness creates something that is really needed in current time of hard economic times, you know, is creativity. It creates creativity. Creativity, that's what we need to put or to implement or seed, if you want, on the students. Make them creative in their questions, in their, you know, learning, in their interaction. Make the self-drive. Well, we make self-drive cars, but we don't want to make uh, self-drive uh, students. Okay, how do you make someone creative? Excellent job, excellent. And that's the topic of my talk, is about psychology. Yes or no? That's the title of uh, that uh, Dr. George presented. And that's what I wanted to say. We need to understand ourselves. We need to understand the psychology of students, how they think, how they are looking at life, how they are looking at the surroundings. And this comes actually from my electrical engineering background. To make a circuit, and I'm teaching the fundamental of microelectronics, I'm teaching them uh, some devices like diodes, transistors, and things like that. In order to use a device in your circuit, you need to know how that device works. If you don't know, you cannot analyze a circuit that has that device. You see what I'm saying? So the students are like devices that you need to understand them in order to make them do what you are looking to to make them doing, like creativity if you want. So we have to understand, I'm not answering this, I'm putting a question, and that's what I like about the knowledge. Knowledge is the art of creating good questions for the next step, yeah. okay? But the problem is you only have your students, for, for us, we have our students six, seven weeks. Okay. okay. How do you get to know your students in that time and still prepare them everything they need to do? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I, I can tell you this is uh, not an easy question. Uh, <laughs> they don't have an easy answer. However, I can suggest some things. The psychology of students is part of their own life. It's not only for uh, university time, you know. So that's why, really, and that's, that's I, I can't suggest, you know. We need, really, uh, seriously, every country, every uh, establishment, you know, every, every society need, really, to promote and need to, you know, put research into practice how people are thinking. How people are thinking and uh, how our students are thinking to promote them, to direct them, and to see. Here will come what? Will come culture. Culture is a big thing. Huh? Every society has its own culture, has its own principles, uh, and what you, what, uh, the way that you teach North American student cannot be applied in Japanese students, cannot apply be in this country. Or, so each society has its own culture, its own uh, principles, its own fabrics, if you want, okay? That the teachers like us, we need to be aware of, okay? Once we get that, database of information, uh, how this, it can be very simple, uh, it's a paper or a, a, a research center, if you will, that you can build this database there, and it's not to humiliate or something, no, every country has its own plus or minus, we are not perfect, you know. So this is for the teachers to understand how to approach the students, what they like, what they don't like, how they think and how they don't think. And this has to be tailored after that to the subject. Okay, so unfortunately, the answer to, the, to your question, 
We have no database. And it's not only to this country. We don't have it uh, most of the countries. Okay? We do not understand ourselves. Like uh, the uh, one that says, oh, we know how to go to the moon, but we don't know even how to walk on the earth. It's sad. It's sad because we lost the vision. That's the thing, as a mankind. <laughs> few, few research, I would say, I haven't really, but really I was searching these things, and uh, few research, uh, really, I, uh, as far as I am uh, aware of, talks about these things. This is an important step for the teachers, for the educators, to know how this, uh, once we know these things, then we can tailor that to our education and make self-aware students, use them to think about themselves and how to learn, and then let them learn by themselves. So basically the teacher role in my philosophy is to seed the knowledge and let it grow in their minds. And then that's it, the rest is history. They will take care of it, they will move forward, they will enjoy, in fact. You don't have to monitor at them. So uh, you will sit in there and see what's going on. If they go in the wrong direction, you give them advice, how, why you tell me that? Because I tried that and that, and they will, oh, thank you very much, now I know, I will go to the next, to the next thread, the next way. Huh? And that's how it should be, in my, in my own uh, humble opinion. And then, once you do that, then that's it, it will be fun, even the teacher, will not get bored. So eventually, over the time, repeating the same course, it will be boring. So efficiency will go down. There is no uh, motivation. What motivation? I'm repeating the same course many years of times over the years, and what, what motivates me? As, even as a teacher, what motivates me? There is no new. Huh? There is no new. Maybe some uh, teaching technologies here and there, blah, 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 but uh, at the end of the day, I'm not doing anything. Huh? But if we make things you know, in a loop, I learn from the students, the students learn from me, you know, and things are dynamic, things will be spicy, will become, you know, something, uh, you know, dynamic and uh, refreshing, and no one will be bored. We will learn all together. The teacher will learn from the students, students will learn from the teacher, and move on. And the knowledge will be flourishing. And the society will enjoy, everybody will be winning in that time. I think, that's my humble opinion. I can give you an example. Go ahead, please. Everything you said, fantastic. Thank you. you nailed it. Thank you, you so nailed much. it, you nailed it. And Thank I'll you. tell you why. I'll give you an example. I teach slow free writing. It's about IELTS. <laughs> so every day for the past six years, I hear, oh, I can't wait to get the IELTS. When they walk into my classroom, oh, I can't wait, teacher, I have to write an essay. It's all about IELTS. And one day, it was last quarter, actually, I lost it. I said, is that what is it? Stop. Is it really? Is, it, is this really about the IELTS exam? Yes, of course. I'm writing this essay for the IELTS. Have you ever thought further? <coughs> Silence. Further. <laughs> Where? <laughs> what do you mean? Have you ever asked yourself, why are you here? Uh, they look at each other. Uh, and then I hear them in Arabic, my dad wants me here. My true. mom wants me here. I don't want to be here. <laughs> yeah. this, this, this is what goes along it with. Is, and yeah, then, and I was like, what are your goals? I ask that question. Have you ever set goals? Yeah. Yeah. They were, but let me tell you. They were so interested in that question. All eyes, goals, what are those? What's so that? Have you ever said, oh, that in, in three years, where do you want to be? In four years? Never, yeah. never. They, they, they love the, they yeah. love the rhetoric, they love the conversation. It got them thinking. Yeah, that's right. We had a discussion about dreams, goals. You created the loop. You created and the loop. You know I could care less about the essay that we were about to that's write it. because that made sense. Yeah. You're, you're trying to teach something for them to make it applicable in their life. Exactly. So that they can make sense out of it. Exactly. And they, are, they don't have that. That's right. They don't that's have right. that. That's because right. Every teacher did that yeah. and got them. You are them making like them self aware, basically. Yeah. You are making yeah. them self aware about what they are doing. Why we are doing that? Or yeah. why this is for? Everybody, everybody, everybody has, has to do that. that. That's the thing. Everybody so that's why it's a universal, it's a universal concept. It's not a concept that you can only apply it in electrical engineering or math or history or... No, it's a universal concept. As I, say, as I mentioned Aristotle when he said that statement, you see a bit, it looks funny, but if you look at it really seriously, yeah, I'm, I'm intelligent because I know I know nothing. He knows that. That's a big achievement. So, because it came back to him. So he looked at, like in the mirror, and that's the education. It's like a mirror. You're making a mirror. Oh, what are you looking here? Oh, there is nothing in here. So I know I know nothing. So that's the education purpose, is to make the students self-aware. And this makes your life much easier. Because you have the experience against the students. They have no experience. And that's an answer for you. 
that since they have no experience, how can you teach them and you assume that they know something? But if you just create a seed and let them do it, and just you stay there and you feed them the experience, like you are putting some water to that plant, huh? little by little, huh? as they grow, and at the end of the turn, oh, what did you learn? Oh, I learned a lot, I learned a business. But if you do it the, the classical way, which is the common one, it's a memory, it's a memory process. Feed me in, I feed you out, bye bye. Good luck with you, give me great, give me a love. Yeah, that's, and it's universal, so it's not really uh, applicable only on one uh, practice, actually on all spectrum of uh, disciplines of education. Uh, so, uh, so this is what, uh, what I uh, wanted to share with you. So basically then uh, teaching is not a master slave or has not, it doesn't have to be a master slave way. It's a dynamic one. And uh, that uh, what makes it, what enhances basically is self-awareness. And so the student makes them self-driving and enjoying and motivated thanks to understanding of their psychology, of course. We cannot know that without knowing that this is part of their psychology. They need to know themselves so that they can drive themselves further and they enjoy what they're learning. That's so, uh, this uh, teaching philosophy I presented in this uh, panel discussion is quite uh, interesting and it goes uh, uh, for a longer time, uh, basically for more than an hour, basically. And uh, you're welcome to go to this bit.ly link, teaching underscore philosophy underscore Faisal's to have the full picture there, in, including the interesting uh, Q&A session and uh, the other uh, uh, contributions as well. All right, so, uh, <clears throat> so basically then the smart teaching includes the dynamic grasping of knowledge. That's what we said. It, uh, it's a central, it's a student-centered, basically is the number, fa uh, the number one factor in, the, in this. And the psychology of students is pivotal, of course, in these things, but we will enhance it with the blended learning. We'll explain that in a second. And of course, all these to enhance one big thing, that's the self-awareness through that, through any means, basically experiential learning, et cetera, et cetera. That's a, a important thing that we need to embed in our education. Now, in my application of this intelligence design of education, basically I included the first way to do that is using a multidisciplinary approach and basically using the STEM curriculum. And here I show you through uh, through this one class in week three, class one, okay. Uh, basically, in one class, I presented math, and this is just an example again. This is a math, a mathematical proof of a certain formula here, which is the barrier voltage of a diode in here, and how it changed over the temperature. Uh, I presented that mathematically using the, this uh, part part of this class, uh, okay, uh, online available, okay, and then I presented by experiment so basically by using the technological aspect i brought a, a diode in here measured it's basically the barrier voltage of that diode and ch change the temperature of that diode of course they can see the temperature there uh, of the diode that's changing and they can see the uh, change of the barrier voltage and comparing the two basically this side actually enhances the understanding of this side or basically uh, support it and increase the convincibility of the, uh, uh, the mathematical proof, okay? So the idea of using multidisciplinary approach or the STEM uh, approach is basically this is excellent because it, it enhances the understanding of something that students are learning using basically multiple disciplines of related to one subject, in this case, the formula of the barrier voltage. Um, and not only that, because also by learning, they we do uh, we do learn by association. Basically, that's how we learn. We learn, we memorize by association. Okay, and that's what makes STEM really a strong tool of education and teaching of kids from any age, from uh, K kindergarten to uh, grade twelve and beyond. Okay, and that's why it's a it's a uh, it's a very very uh, popular in the United States of America and. Uh, it's gaining popularity around the world, okay? And it's a multi-billion business actually in the US. I've attended the last uh, conference where I presented the, 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 my paper in Columbus, Ohio in June, 2017. And uh, I, I could see by my, with my own eyes, it's a very, very big business because it has value to 
the student and society in general. Now, back to the blended learning, that's the multi-channel approach. And that's what I uh, uh, called multimodal learning, basically, in class and off class. And that, the blended learning, blend, we are blending the learning of the subject for the students using the in-class, okay, which is in here, and the off-class, which is in here, okay? So basically what I do first in the preparation, I try to embed STEM into my course before the class starts, then I present and record, huh? remember, record with camera on my YouTube channel, and I'll show you that in a second, as actually was mentioned in the first uh, slide. And then the student later on of the class, he will try to, or he or she will try to basically uh, remember the the moment of learning. Uh, we thanks to the uh, the uh, uh, the camera recording here, and basically by using these two associations, the moment will be recalled of the understanding. And basically, we are trying to implement this kind of associative neural network, which is actually the AI. Uh, uh, part basically the learning we are trying to associate the learning aspect that the student have has in class with the learning moment that it has in in class okay and by by providing this learning moment thanks to the video in here we'll try to retrieve that learning concept uh, uh, of the moment they learning in the class and by the dynamic interaction between the two, basically we are trying to enhance the learning of the student and we'll be able to recall that moment of learning much, much easier, much more effective. And how do I get that? Basically by running a survey to my students. I did that for a, 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 a pre-midterm, before the midterm and before the, uh, the final exam. Okay. I call this method uh, AIM, basically artificial intelligence method, basically of learning and I asked the student if that uh, blended learning was beneficial. As you can see it was here uh, the very useful. Uh, it goes from very bad to very useful. Actually, most of them, they agree that this is the best actually. Okay, uh, they like it a lot. So as you can see, just one thing is that primitive term when the volume of learning was not that much, the very useful one was 53%. That jumped 10% extra before the final, why? Because this uh, blended learning recording of the class was really beneficial for them, okay? That's a huge enhancement and a huge appreciation from the students. And then till now, two years later, still the students are learning from that YouTube channel. Now, uh, one more thing here, just to show you some other aspect, which I published also in my paper in uh, uh, last year's conference of the American Society of for Engineering Education, which I'm a member in. Uh, basically, as you can see here, uh, from where the students, they spend time in revising, as you can see, the green was the most one, and the green is actually uh, most of the time, which is uh, uh, basically, are they, uh, the question was in terms of usage time, how do you study this course from following resources? Here from textbook, as you can see, most of the time, uh, from the PDF, most of the time, but here from the YouTube channel, uh, it, it rarely or uh, most of the time. And the reason, if you compare these three here, okay, and there, you can see that um, uh, the volume, the density of the data was higher in in the PDF slides because that's what represents the summary, okay? The, the students, they go to the summary, if not, they don't understand, they go to the course, I um, mean, textbook. If not, they go to the YouTube channel, okay? Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, survey was done actually uh, during that time. And for more uh, the uh, of, of their response, you can uh, check the my evaluation of my students in the fall of 2016. And these are the uh, comments they presented there for the full report is you can find it there as well. And you can see that report also in this YouTube channel. Unfortunately, there's some issues going on there. And this is the paper I presented. You can go to uh, this bit.ly uh, link, aim underscore for uh, stem underscore files to download the paper uh, about my method I presented in, in, this, uh, in this experiment. Okay, good. So um, this is a... Uh, Another feedback I got from a student I was teaching at the University of Guelph, Amatou Rahim Abbasi, basically I, uh, we interchanged some uh, discussion over LinkedIn. She's uh, 
in connection with me. So basically here, she was uh, uh, saying something really interesting to, uh, about an article she read. She said, it is interesting to learn something, something that you don't, that you didn't learn in school, something that are passionate about, that you are passionate about and relates to your major. See, here we are talking about self-learning person. This is what I call the real biomedical engineering. That's her discipline she's interested in from an artistry perspective. Okay, that and then I replied with this. Basically, I said, unfortunately, universities these days are well disconnected from reality. Unfortunately, of things ROT <laughs> in contrast to IoT, and that's economy, of course. Unfortunately, but still, some work need to be done. You need to go solo if you want to learn. Good luck. All right. She replied again with this comment in here. I learned a lot from you when you taught us back in University of Guelph, and I still remember your words. One of these lessons was how to learn independently and seek for knowledge. Thank you, teacher. And I was really uh, amazed by that. I was very glad, and uh, I was happy to see my efforts uh, working. And uh, always uh, basically uh, 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 praising knowledge, okay? This is the first gift that uh, creator gave us and then we finished with this uh, with these things um so uh, she's uh, she's self learner i would say and that's my uh, greatest uh, you know uh, appreciation from discussion discussing with her so intelligence for education uh, uh, we can basically learn from biology in that uh, that respect so basically biological intelligence systems are inspir inspirational in that case okay and uh, student psychology is very very important we need to know them very well in order to uh, you know teach them well okay and uh, intelligence as a natural power we need to harness it and embed it uh, in our in our education okay that's it so by doing what by doing self-awareness this is number one aspect of education okay using experiential learning self-assessment feedback etc we can embed also intelligence by interconnecting interconnecting various streams or engineering the disciplines uh, uh, to enhance the convincing power and thanks to that that's what we call stem it's been there okay or by using the modalities of teaching by blending them okay digital and in class to improve the recalling and the understanding of the uh, of the thing okay now the seminar in conclusion i would say that intelligence is per pervasive and ubiquitous it's, it's in the universe everywhere okay biological and physical and uh, why why it's useful for us to learn from that because it's time adapted it's been proved and tested over uh, and over again over the long period of time so we can get it from the nature and harness it okay uh, like we did with math but now we are talking about intelligence a second level of you know uh, abstraction okay and uh, implemented in nanotechnology like uh, i was doing at the qnc last year and hopefully in the future as well as well as the internet of things internet of things is another discipline where it's really starving from real intelligence to be embedded which is i'm doing right now uh, in collaboration with national instruments and uh, finally um and that this track of research it would be very, very beneficial to boost fundamental science because that's where the real change will will take place, and that's where the real impact will be will be uh, will be uh, useful to have uh, to change the current economic and uh, you know social life nowadays. We need to learn more about our universe and biology to uh, make a positive change in this world. And uh, basically this will help advance the intelligent electronics as well as driving the, the global uh, economy, not only semiconductor economy. Uh, thank you very much for watching my seminar. I uh, really uh, welcome any question you have. Uh, thanks so much and uh, hope to see you uh, soon uh, somewhere. Thank you and have a wonderful day.